Welcome, Commissioner Georgieva. Thank you for meeting with us today. Um, the results of the recent Eurobarometer were very good. Uh, I wonder what, why you think European citizens uh, showed such strong support for humanitarian aid and what impact that's going to have on, uh, on your work. Uh, well, the um, uh, results are not only very good, they are surprising in the context of hardship at home because yeah. since 2010, the European citizens have increased from 79 to 88 percent their support for humanitarian action. Mm -hmm. And I see two reasons uh, for that. First, the crisis actually brings the best out of people. There is more empathy for those who suffer much more than we Europeans uh, in these difficult uh, conditions at home. And second, this has been very difficult years. Mm -hmm. People have seen dramatic events, starting with the uh, Haiti earthquake, then the floods in Pakistan, then the famine in the Horn of Africa, famine in the 21st century, now the uh, devastation in the Sahel, the Libya crisis, the uh, crisis in uh, Syria. And all of this tells us one thing, that we may be, as a world, over the years uh, becoming richer, but it is also a more fragile world. Mm -hmm. And we Europeans, even in the deepest of crises, are so much more fortunate than millions of people in other places. Um, and do you think there's a need then to increase EU funding given the, the rising number of emergencies? And uh, are you satisfied with the role that EU member states are, are playing in this? In the area of humanitarian aid, we are increasing uh, funding. Um, let me just give you one illustration. Uh, last year, 2011, we started in the Commission with 850 million euros for humanitarian aid. But it was a very difficult year. We had to go to emergency reserve. We ended up spending 1.1 billion and we reached the uh, affected populations, uh, uh, 150 million people with this money. Our member states, despite of the crisis, uh, responded extremely uh, generously uh, to the Horn of Africa famine. We collectively have provided 700 million euros. Uh, that, I think, is going to continue to be the case when there is a big crisis it generates uh, a tremendous outburst of support uh, from, uh, from Europe. Uh, and yes, I do believe that we need to uh, provide more, more resources because they are more frequent, more devastating natural disasters. And conflicts are tearing apart every year some 20 to 30 uh, countries. Uh, but we also face crisis uh, at home. And what it means for us is we have to be very dedicated to use the sacrifice of our citizens well. That is accountability for the results of our work. Make sure that, that what we do is transparent. I'm actually more worried about funding long-term development projects. Uh, I think this is where civil society has to be very vocal to make sure that our member states, even if they cut funding now, they are quick to restore it. Well, better not to cut at all, but if they are forced to cut because of very dramatic domestic uh, circumstances, as, as it happened in Spain, make sure that we go up as growth comes back uh, to Europe and that we respond with priority to the needs of the most vulnerable uh, populations. At the moment, you referred to the emergency in the Sahel. Um, there's food insecurity there that's affecting millions of people. I know a plan is responding with relief items, with uh, child protection, with education. Uh, what are the priorities for the European Commission? Well, we, we have uh, two uh, sets of priorities. One is on the immediate emergency. We identified the risk early. We acted very early. Already in mid-January, I was in the uh, region, we made the decision to double humanitarian assistance, targeting the most vulnerable children, pregnant women, 
elderly. So we have increased funding for uh, nutrition programs, for therapeutic uh, feeding for kids, but also blanket distribution for most vulnerable populations very early. And we will continue to push for support for the most vulnerable and also engaging the countries themselves. Uh, so, so measures we take internationally and domestically, they, they, com they are combined for a, for a high impact. This is for the immediate emergency and things are still very serious. I mean, 17 million people at risk in the, in the, in the countries of the, of the Sahel. Um, big number um, among them are uh, children. But then we have the longer term. And here is the sad reality. In seven years, there have been three devastating droughts hitting the Sahel region, 2005, 2010, and already in 2012. That shrinking of the drought cycle has enormously negative impact. Why? Because people cannot recover. There is not enough time between two droughts for communities to rebuild their uh, resilience. So we absolutely must engage with the region to build this resilience to shocks. Uh, being mindful that in the Sahel, it is not just the drought that hits uh, communities and countries. Insecurity, as it is happening now in Mali, can drag a country back from, from progress it has achieved very fast. So that engagement for long-term resilience, uh, where we take 10, 15 years time horizon and we bring development support and humanitarian aid together so we can be a force for good uh, for the region. This is what we are aiming for. And in terms of this long-term resilience, uh, you've said it's important to link develop or relief with development. What steps are you taking to work more closely with your colleague, Development Commissioner Andres Spielbags? And also, what do you see as the gaps uh, that are there, the challenges you have to bridge that gap? Uh, we have made uh, two priorities for our cooperation. One, linking relief to rehabilitation and development. Two, invest in resilience in parts of the world that are most vulnerable to recurrent shocks. Sahel is one of them, but also the Horn of Africa. Uh, and we can go over the map of the world and we know that there are many other regions, uh, you know, take Haiti or Pakistan. Uh, so we have looked at cooperation in very pragmatic uh, way. Uh, so far, what we have achieved is the following. For the Horn of Africa and for the Sahel, we have put together programs for resilience where we combine our muscle mm -hmm. so we can have a real, real impact. Specifically, what does it mean? It means that our humanitarian interventions take a look into how they can contribute to immediate life-saving operations, but also help communities to be stronger for shocks in the future. Uh, for example, we have revised our food assistance policy in Europe. No more we dump on communities our agricultural surpluses. We don't provide food, we provide cash and vouchers. By doing so, and of course, as long as the, the uh, local markets uh, work, by doing so we feed the hungry, but we also help the local local farmers. And this is an example of how humanitarian aid can be an instrument for longer term uh, resilience. And on the other side, on the development side, we make sure that the uh, support programs for development target the highest vulnerabilities in the Sahel. It is uh, lack of irrigation. Small sc scale irrigation can dramatically change the outlook for a, for a community. Uh, or making sure that governments build stocks 
foodstocks to withstand even the, the worst of, of droughts. This is what our development colleagues uh, can do, or social safety nets. So when the drought, drought occurs, we don't start from zero to provide protection for the mo most vulnerable populations. We know who they are, we know how to, to help them. And that, that we do for the Horn of Africa, that we do for the uh, Sahel. Another example of this cooperation is Cote d'Ivoire, devastated by 10 years of conflict. We came together, humanitarian and development uh, funding, so we can drive, together with the government, we can drive the, co the country towards more uh, stability. What is the advantage? Humanitarians have higher tolerance for risk. They can operate in less secure environment. The development uh, uh, colleagues, they have better understanding of how to build systems, health systems, education systems. Together, together, building our, our strength together, we can do much more. Speaking of vulnerable groups, children are one of the most vulnerable groups in a disaster situation, in particular girls. What is ECHO doing to, uh, to ensure children's rights and also to mainstreaming of gender in your work? Well, we do two things. One is uh, we are always driven uh, by a, uh, a good assessment of needs. In other words, who are the most vulnerable? Where are they? And for this, we rely a lot on our uh, partners like, like, like PLAN or UNICEF to be able to direct assistance to, uh, to children, women, handicapped, the elderly. Uh, Two, we have designed specific interventions that target the uh, kids that are victims of disasters or, or conflicts. Uh, for example, in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, we have a program uh, to deal with um, sexual violence uh, and specifically uh, for uh, underage uh, girls. Make sure that there is a attention paid uh, that there is protection for them, but also that if the worst is to happen, there, there is, uh, in other words, girls fall victims of, of uh, sexual violence, there is a support system to bring them back on uh, their feet. I have met with uh, young girls that have been uh, uh, victimized uh, in, in DRC, uh, and they have found a pathway to a better future. One of them actually has chosen to work on that, to work on helping other girls. Uh, and actually listening to her, this is the kind of reservoir of strength that is necessary uh, to, build, to build more resilience among, among kids. We also have a, um, a sp in 2008 we had developed a, um, it, it's like a policy paper that looks specifically at children as victims of natural disasters and conflicts. And there we, we of course, uh, pay attention to boys and, uh, and girls, uh, and they have uh, separate needs on, 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 a gen on the gender uh, elements. I mean, there are small things that can be done that we have learned from experience, like uh, make sure that uh, in a camp, the uh, bathroom area, there is light and security. Uh, or when, uh, when there is a natural disaster that we target women-led households explicitly. I remember going to Pakistan after the uh, floods, uh, visiting an area and I look around and there are only men. I saw only two young girls, probably too young to be, to be hidden in the, in the tents. Well, unless we proactively reach out and we do it in a way that is sensitive to, to uh, local people, a half of the affected population would, would not get, uh, get help. Uh, and that, uh, for, for, the, for ECHO, I, I say this with pride, uh, lessons have been learned through many years of humanitarian assistance and they are the platform for us uh, to, to do better, to help uh, most vulnerable uh, population uh, better. The ECHO partners with NGOs, uh, like PLAN, for the implementation of a lot of the work that you're doing. What do you see as the added value of working with NGOs? The, 
area that of the world that suffers from disasters and, and conflicts is vast. Uh, if we are to be parachuting assistance uh, top down, many more people would die, many more millions will suffer. The um, NGOs, the grassroots uh, organizations are those that are there. They work with communities and when something happens, when the needs are there, the best way to help people is to use this, uh, this uh, outreach. Uh, and that is what uh, our partners are for us. They are the delivery mechanism in uh, terrible circumstances. Um, and no, no crisis is uh, the same as another one. And th this, these relations that are built locally, they're the way to, to help people in uh, southern Somalia. I visited uh, a village very close to Shabab controlled uh, area where our NGO partner has been there for the last six years. They have built trust with the community. So when the uh, uh, famine hit, they were the natural envoy of assistance. But if they were not to be there for the six years, no way there would have been acceptance of this, uh, of this help. So incredibly important to, n to nurture relations. Uh, and this is what the uh, NGOs are uh, best uh, in, in doing. And then this trust is your protection. But this trust is also the difference between help or no help, life or death for people. Maybe a final question. Uh, you've been a very outspoken champion for humanitarian affairs in your whole time as commissioner. What, uh, what do you want your legacy to be when, you when, when you're finished in this post? I have one uh, single-minded objective, and it is uh, to make humanitarian action more effective as early as possible, prevent unnecessary suffering. And I, for this, I actually have a, a, a simple illustration. This is uh, something that everybody who works on food security knows, on malnutrition, people know it. Uh, you put it around the arm of a kid between nine months and 59 months, and then it tells you whether this, this child is at the risk of malnutrition. When it is in the green, everything is good. It gets into the yellow or the orange, high risk of malnutrition. When it is in the red, this child may not survive. And even if the kid survives, it probably would never be a fully productive member of society. Today, we find it easier to raise money for humanitarian action when we are here, when we are in the red. Because Europeans, Americans, Canadians, Japanese, people just don't want to see kids dying. But we have to move to action early. First, we act early, we prevent suffering. We don't reduce it, we prevent suffering. Second, it costs our taxpayers less. When we act here, in the green, in the early yellow, it costs 10 euros. When we sleep there in the red, it costs 150 euros. No results guaranteed. So my obsession is with preparedness, prevention, disaster risk reduction, dealing with the risks of conflicts early. Make sure that we anticipate crisis, we act early, we target the most vulnerable. Thank you very much, Commissioner Jim.